This is a key stage three presentation looking at floating and sinking, which was part of the forces section of the national curriculum. In this example, we have two objects. The two objects are the same volume, so they take up the same amount of space. If the two objects were placed in water, one of them is floating and the other one has sank. The question is, why does one float and why do, does one sink? And the basic answer to start us all off is the concept of density and that the density of the two substances is different. Because the density of the two substances is different, we have different things going on in terms of floating and sinking. So what is density? Density is a measure of the amount of mass, remember mass is the number of particles the substance is made from, but it's the mass in a fixed volume. So for every meter cubed of volume, how many kilograms of mass do we have? Hence the units are kilogram per meter cubed. If you look at the two diagrams at the bottom, you can see the green particles are arranged into a certain state of matter. So are they solid, liquid, or gas? They're actually gas. The reason they're a gas is because the particles are not physically touching. If it was a liquid, the particles, at least some of the particles, should be touching. And if it was a solid, they would be a formed uh, to be arranged uniformly. The other substance is also a gas again because the particles are not touching. The green, in terms of higher low density, well we can't actually talk about high and low density, it's a little bit of a trick question because something is only high or low compared to something else. So what we can talk about is a higher density than the other gas or we can talk about a lower density than the other gas. And the green particles, because we have more particles in the same volume as the other diagram with the blue particles, then we can say that it has a higher density. So it is possible to show that concept in a mathematical equation. And what we say is that density is equal to mass divided by volume. So if you get the mass of an object measured in kilograms, divided by the volume of the object in meters cubed, you would then be calculating the density of the object in kilograms per meters cubed. So if we go back to the earlier example of the two objects, we've now got some, some data relating to one of the two objects, but it doesn't say which one we've got. It just simply gives us the number 1,380 kilograms per meter cubed. Well, one of the objects has sank, and one of the objects is floating, and the one that sinks is the one that has the higher density. And it actually has a higher density in terms of the potato compared to the apple, but more importantly is that the potato has a higher density than the density of the water. As a consequence, the density of the potato causes it to sink in water, whereas the density of the apple is less than the density of the water, and therefore it will float. Previously, you should have covered the piece of equipment that's on the screen at the moment. Um, and the piece of equipment is used to measure the weight force of any particular object. Remember, weight, of course, is measured in Newtons, which is given a capital letter M. And that particular piece of equipment is called a Newton meter, sometimes referred to as a force meter, but Newton meter is the best term to use. So why do things sink or float? Well, the first thing we need to be able to understand is the concept of mass. Mass is the number of particles that an object is made from. Mass times gravity, or gravitational field strength, will give you the weight of an object. Remember, weight is a force. When we get the weight of an object, we can say that that particular mass, when it's placed in a liquid, its weight force will start to move that object down into the liquid. When that happens, water is pushed out of the way to make room for the object going in. When water is pushed out of the way, we say the water has become displaced. Displaced water will start pushing back 
with a force on the bottom of the object we're putting in, and that force that the water is pushing up on the object with is called upthrust. And the upthrust force, because it's going in an opposite direction to weight force, they will cancel each other out. If the upthrust completely cancels out the weight force, then we say the forces are balanced and that there is no resultant force. When we start talking about weight versus upthrust, we have three possible scenarios. We can say that the weight is equal to the upthrust, in which case, in the example, the submarine will not move. In this example, we are using the symbol and the symbol, the wider end of the symbol is pointing at upthrust and the narrow end of the symbol is pointing at weight. So what that symbol is saying is that upthrust is greater than weight or weight is less than upthrust. And as we read from left to right, we would read that as weight is less than the upthrust. If the weight force going straight down is less than the upthrust going straight up, then what happens is that the submarine will float to the top. And that's because the resultant force, the combined force that shows what happens when we put the weight and upthrust together, would be pointing straight upwards. We do not know how the size or magnitude of that force. And if you don't get magnitude, make sure you go back over the other material and other presentations. But magnitude means size and the magnitude is unknown we just know that in this particular case, the resultant force is upwards and that will result in the submarine floating. In this example, we have flipped the symbol around in the, in the question. and um, This time its weight is greater than upthrust. If the weight force that goes straight down is greater than the upthrust force, then we end up in a scenario where the submarine will start to sink and it will continue to sink until it gets to the bottom. And it's because the resultant force, the combination of the weight and upthrust, will result in a downwards force. And as a consequence, we get sinking. So when the submarine gets to the bottom of the container, the submarine stops moving. If it has stopped moving, there is no force acting on it. Forces are balanced. And if the forces are balanced, equilibrium has been reached. In this particular case, the weight force going down has been balanced by the upwards forces. You can refer to the normal force, but it's been balanced by upward forces. So there's no resultant force acting on the submarine. So the submarine just is at rest at the bottom of the container. If we were actually to measure the weight of the submarine at that particular point using a Newton meter, there would be no weight registered on the newton meter as a result of the forces on the submarine being balanced the weight force of the submarine is balanced by other forces however that means the weight of the submarine now acts on the container so if i was to measure the weight of the container the water and the submarine together it would now be a greater value than when it was just the water and the container on its own and we'll have a look at an example of that what we're looking at now is a more technical question. In this particular question, we have to describe what would happen and then explain why it happens. Well, hopefully you can see that it is a wooden duck. And if you lowered the wooden duck into the water, the wooden duck would float. And that's a simple description of what would happen. The harder part, of course, is to explain why that happened. Well, the weight force of the duck is moving straight down. When we put the duck into the water, it displaces water. It moves the water out of the way. When it does that, it creates what we call an upthrust force acting on the duck. The upthrust force goes in the opposite direction to the weight force. And as a consequence, these two forces start to cancel each other right. And if the upthrust force is big enough to cancel the weight force completely, the object will float. And if that's happening, because we have balanced forces, the Newton meter will actually read a force of zero.
Again, at the bottom, we talk about density values, and you can see that the density of wood is much lower than the density of water. So that's how we were going to work out if it was to float or sink, because with a smaller number, it will float on water. If the number for density is higher than that of water, then the object will sink. We've got the same sort of setup where we have a small duck attached onto a newton meter. But in this case, what we're looking at now is instead of wood, we're looking at lead. Lead, if you look at the table at the bottom, it says has a density of 11,343, which is much higher than the density of water. That means the lead duck is going to sink when we put it into the water. Again, we've described what's going to happen. The next thing we've got to talk about is why it's happened. Well, we've already said about the density of the lead is greater than the density of the water, so we'd get a mark for that. But we want to go into more detail to make sure we pick up all the extra marks available on the question. To do that, we need to talk about upthrust and we need to talk about weight force. The weight force is measured from the Newton meter and the upthrust is going in the opposite direction to the weight force. When the weight force is cancelled out by upthrust, the object floats. As the subject is sinking, then the weight force is always bigger than the upthrust. Up until the object hits the bottom of the container, because when it's resting on the bottom of the container, we no longer have just one force acting against the weight force. We have more than one force acting against the weight force. And as a consequence, the duct stops moving when it hits the bottom of the container. When you put objects into water, sometimes they'll float on the surface, sometimes they'll sink in a bit, and sometimes they'll sink right to the bottom. And it's all dependent on how much of the water we displace. The bigger the water displacement, the bigger the force of upthrust. What that means is the shape of the object actually has an impact on its ability to float. So when you have the same density of material, but you've got different shapes, they can sometimes float and they can sometimes sink. Hence, you can get big giant ships that have a huge weight force, but yet they float because they have such a big area. What you're looking for is when the Newton meter has a reading of zero, the weight force of the object is equal to the upthrust force. If the weight force is bigger than upthrust, the object will sink. If the weight force is less than the upthrust, it will float to the surface or stay on the surface. It is actually possible to do a little experiment which will let you measure the upthrust force. And what we need is a piece of equipment called the Eureka Cam. And a Eureka Cam is just a metal cam with a little funnel in it so that as the water level increases, it pours out the funnel and can be collected so you can measure the volume of water that gets displaced when you put an object into the Eureka can. When we get the volume of water displaced, the upthrust is equal to the weight force of the displaced water. So if we work out the weight of the water displaced, that gives us a measurement for the upthrust force when any particular object is placed into the Eureka can. We can actually use this concept of displacement to measure the mass of an object. If we take a known volume of water and we add any object into that known volume of water, the water level will rise. If we can then measure the new water level, so for example, we have a water jug, we've poured 1,500 milliliters of liquid into it, we put it in the duct and it increases the water level to 2,000 milliliters. The difference between those two is the volume of the object that we've put in, in this case, the wooden duct. So the volume of the wooden duct is 500 milliliters, the difference between the 2,000 and the 1,500. One milliliter is the same as one gram. So if we have 500 milliliters, we have 500 grams. And then we convert because mass is normally measured in kilograms. So to get 500 grams and turn it into kilograms, we divide by a thousand.
and we would get an answer of 0.5 kilograms. So what we're doing now is we're getting the concept of using the Newton meter and displacement and now we're bringing a balance in as well and start seeing a bit of direction between the objects and how the forces change under different circumstances. First part of this question says the weight of the container plus the weight of the water is. Well, if I look at the balance at the bottom, the duct is not in the water. So I can safely say that the balance is only reading the water and the container. It's given me a value of 20. But again, I know what's measuring weight from the question. So I should include units and say that it is 20 newtons. The rest of the question says that the object is 8 newtons. And it is hanging from a newton meter and then we're going to go through some examples of different things that could happen and see how the forces would change so the first one's the easiest one because before the object comes into contact with the water we're dealing with two completely separate bodies well the balance is again only going to measure the water and the container the water's in so that's going to give us a value of 20 and the newton meter is going to give us a value of 8 because nothing's changed at this point but it is important to note the weight of the duck and the weight of the container and the water are both acting in the same direction and therefore whatever answers we get we should always have the same amount of force so no matter what happens the force from the newton meter in the duct plus the force from the water in the container on the balance it's a closed system so we should always have the same amount of force in total we're just going to change how much is going to be measured by the newton meter and how much is going to be measured by the balance so in this question the object is fully submerged but not in contact with the base of the container and importantly, water does not overflow because if the water overflowed, that would affect the mass of the water and as a consequence would affect the number of newtons and the weight of the water. That doesn't happen, so it makes the question easier. What we know is because the object is floating, it is trying to sink. It is not going to float on top. The reason it's not going to float on top is from the earlier question that said about the density of lead being higher than water. So we know that duck is going to sink to the bottom. At this moment in time, the only force acting down is the weight force. The only force acting up is the up thrust. And as we know it's going to sink, the downward weight force has to be bigger than the up thrust. In terms of actual numbers, what that means is on the Newton meter, we have to have a value bigger than zero. However, we also know that as we put the duck into water, the up thrust increased, which means that the value that we had when the duck was out is going to be bigger than the value of the duck when it is in the water because the up thrust from the water resulting from the displaced water is going to nullify or going to balance out against some of the weight force. So I'm just going to pick a value because there's no particular numbers in the question and this we're just going to use the number three. As long as you pick a value greater than zero but less than eight we're okay. And when we pick a number three what that means is the balance is going to increase by three newtons but the newton meter is going to decrease by three newtons. Now in this part of the question what we've done is we are now submerging half of the duct so half of the mass if we're submerging half of the mass the duct will have half of the weight force acting on the balance so when the duct was completely submerged we said that it had three newtons acting on the balance if we now have half of that we would say that we now have 1.5 if the previous question we had chosen a different number, for example, two, then in this question, we would simply say we would have the amount of weight force. Therefore, we would have one Newton. But the most important thing is that always the numbers must total up 
to the combined force that we started with, which in this case was 28. So in this question, half of 3 is 1.5, so the balance will have gone up by 1.5 to take it to 21.5 newtons, and the newton meter will have gone down by the same 1.5, which gives us a value of 6.5 newtons. Now the last thing that can happen is that the duct sinks all the way to the bottom of the container. Now when it sinks to the bottom of the container, it just sits there. When it just sits there, that means our newton meter will say zero. And the reason the newton meter says zero is because the combined forces, not just the upthrust, there are other forces in there as well, but the combined forces acting in an upwards direction are equal to the weight force that is acting in a downwards direction. If we know that the downwards force combined at the start was 20 newtons for the water and for the container and 8 newtons for the, the metal duct, that gives us 28 newtons in total, which means the balance would be reading 28 newtons. If the balance is reading 28 newtons, it means the newton meter would read 0 newtons. Last thing you're going to do is look at each of the bullet points. And for each one, try and make an argument for why that is the most important piece of information you needed to understand and know in order to understand this presentation. Work your way through each of the bullet points, and then if you can, try and put them into some kind of order from most important to least important. It's not a huge problem if you shuffle them about a little bit in terms of the sequencing. The important thing is you can see the connection between each point and the actual presentation. And that's the end of floating and sinking.